Right. All right, everybody, as uh, Mike very kindly introduced me a little before, my name is Peter Russo with Russo Racing. I am a run coach, triathlon coach, and um, that's what I do for a living. And I like it a lot. It's a lot of fun. I get to work with nice people like you. Not a real stressful job most of the time, except for me and emails me all sorts of questions, problems. Um, so we're going to talk about a little bit today is um, getting you to the start line and pacing yourself to your best race possible. I, I will emphasize a lot during this is getting to the start line, okay? If you don't get there, you don't get to race. If you get injured doing something foolish, doing a little too much, you don't get to race, and that is the worst feeling. I have done it on occasion myself, so um, you really wanna make sure you get to race after all the hard work. All right. No plan. If you don't have a plan, you have planned to fail, to get yourself injured. You have to have some idea of what you're doing. You cannot wake up on a daily basis and say, mm, I'm gonna do a 10 mile run today because that's what I feel like. Yeah, you need to have an overall plan, weekly, monthly goals, uh, mileage ideas, uh, a plan, you can buy plans online, uh, there's plenty of places you can go with free stuff. Have some idea of what you're doing every day. It's very, very important. I know so many people who just wake up in the morning and say, today's a good day for 10 miles, it's a nice day out. And then tomorrow's a nice day, I better get another 10 miler. And before you know it, they're in trouble. Um, if you wanna plan your mileage increases, weekly, monthly, yearly, I mean, if you wanna have a big, Overall sweeping scope, you can plan out how many miles you're gonna run a month for this year, for the entire year, for next year. Um, I hope you're all in this for a long time, and whether you're in it to make improvements, raise your best, um, it's really nice to have long-term goals. It really helps keep you motivated on, not this winter, because this winter has been a cakewalk compared to last winter, but last winter I know a lot of people who only are out running on the treadmills because they had plan marathon in mind. Um, you have to plan your speed right along with your mileage increases. You have to tie those together. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, plan out your rest. Rest is as important, if not more important, than the hard pieces of training. You have to plan that. You can't say, well, I'll wait till I'm tired and then I'm going to rest. Never going to work. Because um, you'll never be tired. Yeah, you'll be tired. Oh, I'm not that tired. Um, you want to plan out rest days uh, and rest periods, um, entire weeks. Where Does that mean you take the week off? No. But you want to think about taking your mileage down a notch. And how often you do that really depends on your level of fitness and your level of experience. Um, having a plan is not, having, not the same thing as having a coach. I've written some plans. I've sold some plans. I, 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 it's not that I dislike doing that. Um, but I almost don't like people to tell other people that they're, I'm their coach when they only have one of my plans. It's just not the same thing. I'm not controlling what they're doing. They're not getting feedback from me. A plan is a great thing as long as you are wise enough to use it appropriately and say, well, I know the plan calls for a 10 mile run today, but my shin is bothering me. I should call Mike Silver and get over there and get some work done and not take that run, not go for that run today. Uh, by the way, you can ask questions as we go along. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. If you can make them general, that's better. If you ask me specific questions about, well, like, should I do this many miles today? That's really a hard question. I don't know any of what you do here. Anybody here, I don't know your run miles, so it's really hard for me to say, well, you should do a 10 mile run. Uh, but if you have some general questions, I'm always happy to answer those. Um, overtraining, the number one reason people don't get to race. They just do too much, they get injured, and they don't make it to the race. People find this hard to believe. It's better to be undertrained than overtrained. So if your goal, we'll just pick some round numbers. If your goal was to have a thousand miles in before the marathon, and for whatever reason you got 850 in, that's way better than to go for 1100. You hit that thousand, you're like gonna do a little bit more, that's when you get injured. It's better to go into that race a 
little undertrained than it is overtrained. Um, knowing your limits, that's kind of something you have to learn to, um, to do over time. And the way you learn your limits is to take, uh, keep a good log. You can have a written log. There are tons of online logs. Does anybody here log? All right, a bunch of you do. You know, even, you know, every, does anybody have like the expensive Garmin watches and all that kind of stuff? You know, there's so many logs that you can just, if you have a nice watch, you can download it directly onto like a Training Peaks that gives you a free account. There's plenty of free accounts out there. Um, you log it, it gives you a running total. You can look back at it in past years. Um, how many miles did I run there? Did this work out well? Um, but by keeping that log, you can really plot and look on a graph, where did I get injured? Where did I get hurt? What, my, what limit of, was my mind? Well, great. I was running 30 miles, I felt good. I was running 40 miles, I felt good. Look, every time I hit 45, 50 miles, I had a breakdown. It's a great way to learn what your limits are so you don't exceed them. And everybody's is different, and it takes a while to get there to, to know it exactly. Um, be careful with the formula set mileage increase thing. So a lot of times you read online, it, has everybody here read 10% is what you should increase per week mile-wise? Everybody's probably seen that online. Um, no, no. 10% may be good for you, may not be. And again, it's something you learn over time. 3% may be a good marker. Um, how many years you've been running is also key in that. 10% um, may be too little. You may be able to some weeks do 20% as long as you're careful and maybe take it back down a little bit the next week. Uh, I like 5%. I think that's a little more conservative. Uh, most people don't have any problem bumping it up 5%. All right, listen to your body. And this kind of goes back to what Mike was talking about. What most people do is, if something hurts a little, don't ignore it, treat it. And that can be treating it yourself, getting to uh, an orthopedic, getting to a PT, but do something about it. If your foot hurts, don't say, well, tomorrow will feel better. Who does that? Come on. <laughs> Sorry, I knew this guy kind of looked like it right here. Ah, it'll feel a little bit better tomorrow. Well, maybe if I, you know, maybe if I do a little foam rolling massage today, it will feel better tomorrow. Treat it, don't just ignore it. Um, if something keeps hurting, don't ignore it more, right? It hurts a little more today. Yeah, just one more run. I just need that one more run. I'll ignore that pain today, and that's that's a that's a downhill slide right into um, a painful injury. Um, if something really hurts, stop. I know a lot of people who have just run and run and run until now you're not running for weeks and weeks because you just didn't stop. So if it hurts, stop. And you also want to pay very very close attention to pain. It's an indicator. And sometimes there's, I mean, there are pains when uh, doing a 20 miler. At the end of a 20 miler, how many people have had some quad tightness? I mean, almost everybody's had some quad tightness. That's, quads get tight. That's, that's, a, that's a, a soreness pain. And then I'm sure some of you had some injuries where you were running along and maybe your foot hurt and it was like, oh, that hurts a lot. And then you said, ah, that's not too bad. Pay close attention to the different kinds of pain. It's, it's a, it'll be a big help for you. Oh, and I, I guess I should have addressed this. This is, this is a running injury. <laughs> I tripped while I was running. Um, a key thing that most people, and, and Mike works with his runners on this, and I work with all my runners on, and this has been in, in the news lately, but the, there's tons of evidence that comes out and talks about your cadence while you're running. What's your RPMs? Um, you can have, if you've got a nice watch like this, it'll actually measure it for you. It's got a metronome built in. You can get a metronome app for your phone if you run with your phone. You can buy a little fitness uh, trainer. It's actually for the pool, but it's actually another metronome. Run with it on occasion. You don't have to listen to the beat the whole time. You might go insane. Um, but run with it. Find out what your current cadence is. Uh, optimal cadence is somewhere around 180. It's not the same for everybody. Uh, taller people generally have longer stride, so their cadence may be a little bit lower. Um, but they've shown that when you improve your cadence, you can't overstride, uh, and you're just much less injury prone. All right, so 
I see people out running with really slow cadence. I ran with my wife two days ago. My cadence was terrible, <laughs> terrible. So I've tried to work with it just a little. Um, How's so, that work out? <laughs> uh, I'm usually pretty diplomatic. Um, and she's getting ready for a marathon. So she was more than well, if it had been a normal run, she would have said shut up. So, um, so you want to play with it. You want to figure out how to maximize it. Yes? Cakes is your RPM. How many steps per minute? What, so, yes. Well, what, what did that change between just a practice run? Well, that's what, you know, what because, I mean, I did the indoor master in Providence like a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like, I was zipping, and I mean, I didn't do too well, but uh, my stride was a lot longer, and the cadence wanted, was a lot faster. Exactly. So it's not always going to be exactly the same, but what you see a lot is when people are running slower, the cadence is really slow. Yeah. And then they're overstriding, and that's where they're hurting themselves. And then when they're running faster, they're still overstriding, but their cadence picks up. So you're running, your cadence will be faster slightly when you are running speed, but your stride will open up some on that. Um, so, you, yes, you, it's not always exactly the same, but you don't want it super slow all the time. You want to practice a faster cadence. And a great way to practice it is when you're on a treadmill is nice because you can set it at a set speed because when you increase your cadence, you don't necessarily want to increase your pace. So when you're outside, a lot of times, if you try to increase your cadence, you're gonna start running a lot faster, make it too hard to run. Right, right. That's what, if you do it on a- How do you increase your cadence without- Shorten your stride, shorten right. your stride. And that's why it's great on a treadmill, because you can set it for whatever pace, right. an eight minute a mile, you can set on the treadmill, right. and now put on that metronome and try to match the metronome and pick up your cadence. That's why it's really good to practice that on a treadmill. And I hate the treadmill, but mm -hmm. I do get on occasionally to practice the cadence. So. Uh, balance your body, keep yourself strong. This goes to what Mike was talking about. Some strength training, run specific strength training. So like he showed the big muscle guy, um, you know, you don't need to lift weights. I, I do not like a lot of weight lifting. I do almost, all my athletes do Swiss ball, medicine ball, some kettlebell stuff, body weight type of exercises, walking lunges, you can do some weight vest stuff. Um, but I like run specific stuff. Off season you can do some weights at the gym and some different kind of stuff, but run specific strength training. Run gate analysis. I don't want to just keep pimping Mike, but Mike is he's out of the room, which is nice. He's very, very talented. He's very patient. Uh, we're not talking about you. Um, this is well worth doing. It will, uh, it's, it's very eye-opening. You think you're doing one thing, you see yourself on a treadmill, doing something different, you can find out the right exercises to, so that you're not sagging. I have, I've done some run gate analysis with Mike, with my athletes, and I have some good runners, some very fast runners, and you would think like the very fast runners have these perfect strides, and that nothing can be fixed, or no, and you, you can tweak. There's always something that you can find that will make you a better runner. Uh, Mike touched on this a little bit. But the surface you train on is really important. I'm not so much concerned with, with the amount of pavement, uh, concrete versus pavement, they're both pretty hard. But I do like to see people work on softer surfaces. Oh, I'd be careful of prone in the road. I don't know how many of you live locally. Uh, most of the roads around here, we have sidewalks. So it's pretty flat. But if you live out in the country, and you run, like my dad lives out in situated, if I go out there for a run, I, I, I used to, I don't do that anymore. The roads are so prone. Um, it's really hard on your body, a really great way to get injured. So be conscious of you know, the surface you're running on. Look for softer surfaces, speed workout. If you can do it on a track, that's perfect. If you're getting ready for the marathon here in Providence, last year all the tracks were still under snow, so you had an excuse to not run. There's no excuse not to go do speed work on the track if you're doing speed work. It's just, there's none. Um, you can find some trails for long runs. That's perfect. It, that's just, softer on it. You, besides being softer on your body, there's a lot of stability muscles that you use on a trail that you don't use on the roads. So it's excellent work. Um, if you don't have two pairs of shoes, you're selling yourself short. I know so many people, well, I have one pair and they're good, so I'm gonna keep wearing them until they're not good. Two pairs, minimum. If you saw my room, you'd think I was a Mel DeMarcos. I have so many running <laughs> shoes in there. It's crazy, but 
You need more, why? Why do you need, does anybody know why you need more than one pair of shoes? So that you're not always breaking in a new pair of shoes. That is, that's a good point. But running, sho running shoes, the middle section of running shoes is almost like a styrofoam, and there's air bubbles in there. So when you run on them, you compress those air bubbles, and they do come back, but it takes them at least a solid 24 hours to bounce back. So if you keep compressing them without giving them a chance to bounce back, they never bounce back as much. So if you have two pairs of shoes, you're rotating through it, the shoes always have a chance to recover. Um, and you can do two different kinds of shoes, which works your legs slightly differently, the muscles a little bit differently. So again, now you're working things, you're not pounding that same muscle the exact same way every day. Um, and that's what you want to keep in mind. How much pounding are you taking? That's why you want to get on softer surfaces. Too much speed. Some people love to race every week at 5Ks, 10Ks, um, and then they're doing a track workout in the middle of the week. Um, speed work by itself, just the minute you start doing speed work, increases your chance of an injury by 25%, um, which kind of ties into the next 25%, which is if you do do speed workouts or any type of tempo work, it should not be more than 25, maybe 30% of your total weekly mileage. Um, this is, this is the number one way that I have found people get injured, by increasing their speed work and the distance at the same time. So you say, well, I'm starting my marathon training today, I'm gonna to start upping my miles, and I'm gonna to get to 50 miles a week. And I'm gonna put in speed workouts during the middle of the week. That's the number one way. Get to your mileage, then start, you know, get your base down, then add in your speed. Okay, I know Mike talked about uh, being against rest, ice, compression, and elevation. He has, he's on a, he's a meth head back there. <laughs> I, like rest, I like rest, ice, compression, elevation. Uh, I found personally that it works well for me. Most of my athletes find it works well. I don't like ice packs, I like ice massage. I think if you take ice cubes, you freeze water in a cup. If you've got something that's sore, an injury, and you massage it with the ice, you're kind of taking down the inflammation and you're keeping the blood flow going. So uh, I, I do like that. See your PT or orthopedist. You need to see someone who's sports minded or a specialist. If you go to a, a, any PT, I have friends who are PTs besides Mike, who's kind of a friend. Uh, <laughs> they're great guys, they know their stuff, they know their physiology, they know all the stuff. They don't think the same way that Mike d does at his practice. The people who work for him, and I'm sure there are others too, they think sports, they think about getting you up and running again, getting you moving, what's the best way for you to get going again. They're not gonna say, well, take a month off and do these exercises. Mike or his staff or any good sports-minded <clears throat> doctor is gonna work with you on getting you back on, on the road. Your orthopedist, your podiatrist, whoever, whatever doctors you see, they should have, they should know that you work out, you work out a lot, you run, and that you want to get running again fast. If you're just seeing some guy you like, but he doesn't really get runners, I'm gonna say you're wasting your time, but they're just gonna tell you to take a month off. I don't know how many times have the doctor just told you to take a month off? You know? I had a doctor once tell me not to run for a year and come back and see him. <laughs> I was like, which way is the exit, pal? You never saw him again, right? No, I did not. I never saw that guy again. If I had four sports-minded doctors tell me don't run for a year, then I'd find a fifth. But <laughs> I would at least start to pay attention to it. But one guy who says not to run for a year, I'm not listening to that. I'm finding somebody who understands sports. A um, Couple last things on injuries. A long, easy run is still a hard run. If you run 18, 15 miles, and you just run at a very easy conversational pace, and then the next day you say, well, I didn't run hard yesterday. That's a long run, it's hard on your body. It's, it's just not an easy run. Think a little bit out of the box sometimes. Uh, I don't know how many people do long runs every weekend. I do not like that. I like every other weekend. Or I'll train in 10 or 12 day blocks. Or I'll have my athletes tra train in 10 or 12. So maybe they're doing a long run every 12 days or every 10 days. Don't, a week is just a man-made concept. So if you train in 14, 15, 20-day blocks, and you can do it however it works best for your body. Just don't think it's Monday through Sunday. Sunday has to be a long run day. Maybe it does because of your schedule, but not because of your body. 
Um, most of your injuries, sicknesses are going to happen right before your big race. That's when you're, you're usually when you most run down, your immune system is down. That's when you have to be super, super careful. <coughs> Uh, washing hands, extra Purell. If you're traveling to a race, put a mask on on the plane, look like one of those crazy Chinese tourists. That <laughs> see. It just looks nuts. Um, but you really want to be cautious about not getting sick and not injured. I'll, I'll bet you Mike can tell you a zillion stories about how, how many people will come into his office three to four weeks before Boston, just the amount of people coming in saying, Oh, I just did my last long run and now I'm going to explode. I need help. So that's when it's really dangerous. So we want to be very careful there. Nothing new in the month before the race, your big race, except new shoes and race clothes. Don't go into the race with old shoes. I don't think you should go out the day before and buy a pair of new running shoes. But that month, month before the race, yeah, buy a new pair of shoes. Nice light cushion, run in them. 30, 40 miles, break them in so there is some break in period and then save them for the race. They should not be everyday trainers. When you go out on race day, that should feel like awesome, great, fluffy, light. I'm gonna nail this. So, new shoes and maybe some nice new race clothes, but that you've already worn it. That the nice and new one don't smell really bad like the rest of those clothes that really just kind of stink now. All right, on to pacing. This is how I coach and the numbers I like to use and the percentages. Um, there are a lot of different ways to look at it. A lot of coaches look at it differently than I do. It doesn't mean they're right and I'm not because I'm right and they're wrong. No, <laughs> just different ways of looking at it. Different things work for different people. Um, there are three ways of monitoring your performance and pacing. There's RPE, rate of perceived exertion. Does everybody know what RPE is? Mm -hmm. We're gonna talk about that in a minute, okay? Um, there is your actual pace. You can actually go by minutes per mile, or you can use heart rate or kind of combine all of those and, as part of your feedback. Okay, RPE. RPE is a scale that is technically goes from 1 to 20, but most people use 1 to 10. So that's what this first uh, little header describes. Rate of perceived exertion. So you are basically talking in your own head and deciding what level of exertion I'm at. One is basically sitting, barely moving. Nine would be a 5K, almost as hard as you can go. And 10 would be the last quarter of a mile of a, of a 5K, just all out. So that's absolutely the hardest. Um, so if you're running a half marathon, that's like a seven to an eight that you feel like, I can do this for a while. Um, marathon would be six to a seven. Easy slow training is four to a five. I have workouts that I give my athletes to determine what level uh, those should all feel like. So I will tell people to go out and do a six mile run. And on that six mile run, I want you to go out and run as easy as you can. That's a four or a five, okay? So now pick it up just a little bit. Make that five a six, just a little bit. Make that six a seven. Just, to, you know, maybe do this a minute at a time. Seven before you go to eight, go back to seven, go back to six. Feel the little subtle differences in what that feels like. Uh, I work with athletes on all who have every gadget and have no gadgets, and they all do well. So you don't necessarily need heart rate monitors um, and all the other type of gizmos you can certainly do it by RPE, but you really need to know what that means and not just guess at it. You have to go out and practice it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, most of your marathon training should be done fairly easy at level five. Um, one of the mistakes I think most people make, unless you're very new to this work, if you are, if this is your first marathon or your first half marathon, you really want to, and you've not been a runner your entire life, you really want to focus mostly on getting the distance in and not going too hard. You want to finish your first race and not get injured. If you're an accomplished runner and you've done marathons, half marathons, and you've been running for a long time, then you can worry about adding in speed work and adding in difficulty level. So the main mistake I think most marathoners who are experienced make is 
they do their long runs, they do some speed in the week, and then they do their, all their long runs really slow and easy. It just doesn't, it doesn't pan out. You need to do some tempo work during your long runs. Not a ton, not the whole run, but the back end of that run should have some tempo work in it. Every, at those, long, those long runs, the last four or five miles should feel like a, a marathon. Should feel. You need to be mentally and physically prepared for what that's going to feel like, and it's pain, really. It's, it's going to feel like pain. <laughs> Listen, endurance, endurance athletes are a community of masochists. We all like the pain or you wouldn't be doing it. Um, so you need to have some long runs with the six and the seven level in there, that, that little bit closer to the tempo pace, above the marathon pace. You need to have some half marathon training at a, a pace in there as well if you want to make improvements. Anytime you start working any above ma a half marathon 10K pace, you start getting into that 5K type speed work during marathon training, it, you have to be really careful. It's, it's, it's a good recipe to break down. Um, you can train by actual pace, your minute per mile. You, get, you have to figure out what's my pace supposed to be. So you need to set up a pace based on either a road race, a 5K is great, 10K is fine, um, or you can go out and do a self-test, measure, you know, measure out a 5K or a three mile. You can go online, you can get apps to your phone with pace calculators, all sorts of stuff. Once you have a, a race pace, a 5K or a 10K, you can then break down approximate approximate race paces for the other distances. They don't always hold over completely true, but it gives you at least some idea of what your pacing should be. So you may do a five, maybe do a 5K and you run that 5K at an eight minute pace and then you go to like McMillan's race pace calculator and they tell you, well, then you're gonna run your marathon at about a 10 minute pace. It might be faster, it might be slower, but it'll give you, it'll give you a whole breakdown of different paces that you should train at. So it at least gives you some idea of where you, you know, what you should be training at. Um, like the McMillan, so I just mentioned the McMillan uh, pace chart. I think it's a free app, or it might be 99 cents. It's a really nice app. It'll break down all sorts of stuff. What you should run, all types of repeats at. Um, again, some people go from a 5K to a marathon much more linearly, yeah, um, than other people. So it's it's not an exact science. Um, so if you ran that 5K and eight minute pace, your long run should be at least nine minute pace. Probably closer to nine and a half or 10 minute pace. Tempo work, so that's kind of up in that uh, half marathon type pace. So that should be about 30 seconds a mile faster than your marathon goal pace. So if your marathon goal pace, when, if we go back and it's a 10 minute mile, you should be doing your tempo work at like 9.30, 9.20, depending how you feel, the conditions outside. Um, speed work, if you do something in that, that 10K area, that could be about a minute, maybe a little more than, I had 70 down to 75, so um, you probably want to run like an 8.45 pace again for that 10 minute pace. Um, recovery, that really, recovery can be as slow as you want it to be. Just nice, easy, super easy type. It doesn't even have to look at your watch. I send out all my athletes once a week, once every two weeks on a, a recovery no watch run. No watch, not allowed to wear it. Just go out, enjoy your run. You're not worried about, oh, don't smile back there. You know the no watch run we're on. Uh, it's a great run. It's hard for some people to do and get into. But once they do it, they learn to enjoy it after a it's while. It's really hard to leave your watch at home when you're training. Try it. Try it if you're training with a uh, with a watch, or if you leave your watch at home and do not look at your watch. It's so tough. It's very tough. It's also very free. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So and then there is training by heart rate. To train by heart rate, you need to know what your max heart rate is. Um, the best way again is to do a 5K and then run that 5K as hard as you can, and that last quarter mile jam it as hard as you can. It's not going to be your exact max heart rate, but it'll give you an idea within five, 10 beats. It gives you a pretty close area. Don't use formulas. They're totally inaccurate. I was just playing around with one the other day because I was working on this. And it had my heart rate 20 beats lower than what my max heart rate is, just by the age factor. It's, they're just not worth doing. Do a test, go out and do it yourself. 
if you can't find a road or race to do, do it yourself. Um, so, let's say your max heart rate will take a nice easy 200, nice easy round number 200. So, your easy long runs should be 65, 70% of that max heart rate. So you're in that 130 to 140 zone. That's an easy run. That can be very difficult to go out and do a run that easy. And you're right, looking at that watch, oh, I'm going nowhere fast. <laughs> That's important. There's, there's so many systems in your body that are built up during those long, slow runs that if you run too hard all the time, which is the number one issue I see with athletes. Everybody wants to get in a good workout, right? I go out and get a good workout in. That good workout, 99 times, it's just too hard. It's a little too hard. So you want to make sure you stay in that zone for the easy runs, tempo runs. 80 to 85%, so that's in that 160 area. Speed work, 90%, so now you're up to like 180, only, only, almost all the way up to 200. Um, and how would you race those heart rates? So, at, so a 5K, you want to race at about 95% of that 200, so at about 185 to 190, bouncing around there. And then you can just, you know, the 10K, 90%, half marathon, I would probably say a little closer to 85%, especially the second half. A marathon, 75% to 80% of your max heart rate. So we're, now we're looking at 150 to 160. You wanna start off at 150. You don't wanna start off at 160. You wanna start off at 150 and let it gradually build to that 160. And then the last two miles. If you have anything left and you can go over 160, go right ahead. All right. How do you incorporate all these training pieces? A lot of it depends on your experience, your fitness level, and your goals. Are you looking to finish? Are you looking to set a PR? Have you been running for two years, five years, 10 years? All, how many miles have you put in over those years? All those things come into account. Um, just starting out, again, means a lot more very easy base building miles. The more advanced you are, the more tempo, speed workout you can put in. Um, again, in general, if you're running 100 miles a week, who's a 100 mile a week runner here? <laughs> but if you were, I just pick 100 because it's a nice, not round number. If you were running 100 miles a week, 70 miles of, the, of, of that running should be easy. So that'd be 35 if you're running 50. And don't ask me if you're running 40 because now you're starting at percentages. And I'm not going to do that. Um, Once your long run base work has been set, once you've got that long run down, you've got a couple of 15 milers in and you're going from there, that's when you want to start adding in some tempo speed work. Again, only if you're looking to improve in your experience. Um, each week should have two hard runs at the most, and that's runs with pace work. So if your long run is a hard run, that means you have one other hard run during the week. You don't have to do a hard long run every week for a marathon it every other week and back off in that middle week and do a little bit more speed in there. Uh, make sure the easy days between the hard, there are easy days between the harder runs. Just because your schedule is really tight doesn't mean I'm going to squeeze in a hard run on Tuesday and a hard run on Wednesday. Tuesday is a hard run and Wednesday, preferably Thursday as well, will be easy runs before another hard run Friday or over the weekend. Um, and I would, as I mentioned before, don't be afraid to make, make your week longer. And what I meant by that was, like I mentioned before, uh, your week doesn't have to be seven days. I've done, a, I've personally have had a lot of good luck with, with twelve, uh, with the twelve day cycle of my workouts, where I do a long run every twelve days instead of every seven days or every fourteen days. It works out really well. I'm lucky; my schedule is fairly flexible, so I can I can drop one in the middle of the week. Um, I know that's not possible for everybody. Um, and I think, oh, all right. How to pace that race. If you are running, if you feel like you're, when you're starting out a marathon and you feel like you're running the right pace, you're going too fast. Everybody starts out too fast, okay? If it feels like, boy, this is good, I can hold this, back off, back way off. When you get, to, there's always somebody at the first mile counting out to how fast you're going. If you hear, if, like if you're targeting eight, and you hear 7.30, back off, you're going way too fast. There is no such thing as a time back. 
Has anybody ever heard, I'm going to bank five minutes at the first part of this race? I've heard tons of people say it to me, I'm going to bank five minutes in the first half of that marathon. There is no time bank. You cannot save time. That is the best way to have a disastrous race. You, you, it just doesn't work. Um, negative to even splits are the best way to go. And I say course dependent because when you take on a course like Boston, that one's a little weird because it's so downhill at the beginning and then uphill at the end. But generally speaking, on a flat course, did anybody here watch the Olympic trials? Yeah, awesome racing. Meg, even split. Galen Rupp, negative split, two minutes. That's how you run a fast race. If you take your marathon out too fast, you will pay for it in the second half. Well, you, yeah, you get pace with Meg all along, even until the end, and, and then he just, just put off. it down. And, and that's, that's. I mean, he looked beautiful at the end. It was fantastic. Yeah. I think it's every world record from 5K up has been built on a negative to an even split. Can you explain split? Yeah. Um, okay, it's great. Yeah. So the split is negative split means. You've taken the halfway point, so at a marathon, the half marathon point, 13.1 miles. So let's, again, we're gonna run, we're gonna run a marathon in two hours. You wanna make sure your half marathon is at an hour. And the second half of your marathon is also at an hour. You don't wanna run that first half of the marathon in 55 minutes, because now the second half of the marathon you're gonna blow up and you'll never run an hour or an hour and five minutes. You're just gonna explode. Does that, does that answer the question properly? Does everybody get that? Negative split. So it's better off breaking even on being a little over on the first half. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Pick it up the second half. It's hard to do. It's very, pacing is very hard to do. That's why you, you want to practice that pace. When you practice your pacing at home and your training runs, you have to think, this is what I'm going to do in a race. When you get to the race and you run that first mile and it was supposed to be an eight minute and it's 7.30, don't think to yourself, well, I've never done this before, but I could do it today. <laughs> it's not going to work like that. You want to think, I'm going a little too fast, and my adrenaline's pumping, this is great. I'm going to take it down a notch. Recover this mile. I like heart rate monitors um, for most of my age group athletes. It just gives you some guidelines. It keeps you easy, keeps you going easy on easy days, and when you're racing, it gives you some ideas. But you need to know, I like everybody to combine. I like people to combine heart rate monitors and RPE. I like people to know what it should feel like. Your heart rate monitor can break. If it's gonna break, I guarantee it'll be race morning. And you wanna know what it should feel like when you're out there. Um, I think. All right, last, quick last thing. Racing to win and racing to, for a PR are two different strategies. You have to have a plan for both of them and you have to stick to your plan until it's not the time, until it's time not to stick to the plan, which is a whole nother story. That's if something goes wrong, then you always want to have a, a backup plan. Racing to win, if you're racing because you want to beat your friend, or you've got a group, maybe you're doing a corporate challenge, then you want to race with keeping them, their pace in mind, watching them, kind of surging, breaking them. That's one way to race. If you're racing for a PR, it, you know, need to know what your capabilities are, what your pacing is and sticking to it. Because they're completely different, completely different racing. Does everybody understand? I mean, does it sound crazy? It doesn't sound crazy. Okay, good. And then I talked about the world record being built on negative splits. All right, and one last thing. This is a big event. You've trained long and hard for this. If you've done, especially if you're doing the marathon, you've trained long and hard for this. It's supposed to be enjoyable. Have some fun with it. Don't get too wrapped up in it everything I just said to do. <laughs> okay, does anybody have any questions? If we're talking about the rest days, you're talking more about rest and running, it's okay to be doing the smart strength training, the off days is okay? Um, it really, rest it, it, I mean, rest can mean, rest can mean a lot of different things. It could mean getting on the bike at the gym and spinning really easy. Right, I was going to say, as long as it's not the actual As long as it's not running and it's not taxing. As long as you're not taxing, because remember, your cardio, you have to think of your cardiovascular system as a muscle. So your heart and lungs, you have to kind of think of it as a muscle. So if you're running a lot of miles all week and then you go and you do a two hour workout at the gym on the bike and the elliptical, sure you haven't pounded your legs, but you still taxed your heart and lungs. Does that answer the question? What yes, do you no. recommend? Do you recommend running like three days a week, four days a week, five days a week? I know there are a lot of three-day-a-week uh, three 
plans. I do not like those. I do not believe in those. They work. People do them, and they get through their marathons by like four days of, uh, of running. If you can take more and you're super competitive, then more. But four days, I think, is is, the, is what you want to be at. at, at, at and back to back, like really, your schedule only allows like you have three days in a row. You have to take a day off, then another day, then you take another day. Yeah, little mini blocks are fine. You can run back to back, absolutely sure. But you want to make sure one of those runs is easier than the other run. Okay. Was it somebody else had a hand up? Where do you, where do you train? Where do you train? Where do what? Your runners. Oh, I mean, you know, at, I live in East Providence. Um, I have local people. I have, with the magic of the internet, I have people all over the world. It's fantastic. I, I was Skyping with uh, one of my athletes uh, who lives in London this afternoon. So it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, and with, I use a system called Training Peaks, which is really kind of neat. Um, everything's uploaded. I can see everything. I can see where they run. If they use their heart rate monitor, I, and they have a GPS watch, I can see paces, heart rates. You can plot all that stuff yourself. It's a big help. And it'll give you, a, 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 again, a system like Training Peaks will, t will total your weekly mileage for you as long as you enter it in or you watch downloads. And so it's really easy to keep an idea, you know, keep tabs on how many miles you're getting in. You train any distance runner or? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't go track. I don't do hurdles. Uh, <laughs> any of the track events, I, I am not an expert at. Chocolate? Yeah, that would be me, yeah. With this, with my bottom line account, I'll do the chocolate. What do you recommend for, like, nutrition? When you do the longer runs, you use it? Generally, you know, everybody's so individual. Um, I personally like fluid. I don't like gels very much. I know like bites better than gels just because it gives you something to chew on and makes you feel like you're doing something. That's my preference. Um, I, I, athletes, every athlete has different tolerances. Um, and again, some of it, if you're gonna go out and you're running your first marathon, it's gonna be a five hour, six hour marathon, you're gonna need more calories than somebody who's gonna run two and a half hours. There, it's, just, it's just a fact. You're gonna need to take in much more fluid and many more gels than that two and a half hour marathon. And you can do it because you're running slower. They're running at a higher pace and their body's under a lot more stress. They just can't digest that much while they're running. And then I, I read that you should do something like 15 minutes before you start the race and then you wait till you hit, like let's say you were doing a half, you hit that like four or five mile mark, then you have something else and then you run another like four mile or five mile some of that depends on how fast you're going to run those four miles, and some of it depends on how intense your running is going to be um, and what you ate for breakfast. It, it's really hard to say. What I will tell you is, whatever you're going to do for eating and drinking, if you haven't done it three times in a practice run, then just go with water. If you haven't practiced it, stick with water or Gatorade, and don't decide on, on race day, I'm going to drink this or I'm going to drink that. I, for me, the, the, the last two thirds of a marathon, if they have Coke out there, the last third of the marathon, I love Coke. It's sugar, as long as it's flat. It's sugar and caffeine. But I have people who drink a Coke and throw it up immediately. And so you, I practice drinking Coke. So you, 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 know, you wanna practice whatever it is you're gonna do a bunch of times. Practice, practice the meal you're gonna eat the night before. How does that sit in your stomach? Practice the meal you're gonna eat, the number of hours you're gonna eat it before that run. I mean, it's just all. Practice everything you can do four or five times before you do your big race. You're going to feel so much more confident when you go to do the race. You're just going to feel, especially if it's your first long race, you're going to be really nervous. The more you've done, the more you've done, practiced, and prepared for it, it just takes a lot of that out. Well, then the big unknown is the weather. The weather, I, that's just, you know, you have a plan, right. and that's, what, so that's kind of what, when I was <laughs> going back to one of my uh, other slides. LA's um, run. Course dependent, and if you get to race day and it's 80 degrees and you've been training in 60, pacing goes out the window. That's why I like heart rate because now you can at least go by heart rate a little bit. And even then, your heart rate's going to be higher and you can probably tolerate some, some higher heart rates, but maybe not. So I, I would advocate that. You want to be really careful. And you, have, you want to be smart. If you get to a, maybe you've trained really hard and this is going to be a PR for you, and you get to the course. It's 85 degrees, and you think it's going to be a PR, and you PR in 60 degrees last year, probably not going to be a PR. 
it's, it's, it's not fun, or I don't want to say it's not fun. Make it fun. Say, well, this is my goal. Readjust. Don't say, oh, crap, I'm not going to PR. You worked hard to get there, so readjust. Say, well, this is my goal today. I want to run, I want to set a PR for 80 degree day. Anybody else? No, oh, that's it. Great. Um, I want to thank Susan and everybody at Road Races. And so please. one comment about hiring a coach as opposed to having a plan. So I give you a little example. These two guys have not paid us to be here. I believe in both of what they do. Um, you can have a plan, and if something happens in your plan, you get injured or you have something bad happen to you, your schedule doesn't work for it, the plan isn't really going to compensate for that. Peter will work with you not only on your what your schedule is like, what you can tolerate for nutrition, what you can tolerate for hydration, but also for the course. So for anybody who's run like our course before, you know that there's certain parts that are really flat. At the end, there's a really big uphill by Monroe Dairy. When Peter plans out your your workouts, he's going to account for like that that late race incline that happens in those places. So it's really good to have stuff like that. Um, as far as Mike. Um, so I trained for Boston. I got injured because I did all the wrong things. Um, I went to see a doctor, and the doctor said, you should never run again. <laughs> and I went to see Mike, and Mike got me to Boston. So, and it's through run gate analysis, it was through massage, it was through physical therapy, and he said, you can run this, and I'll get you there. So he's, uh, he's a god in my mind, so I believe in what these guys are doing. So... Um, <laughs> shortcut it because it will give you like years of running ahead of you. So thank you guys both for coming. We appreciate it.